Now, we'd like to begin by thanking Papunya Tula artists, whose resilience, creativity, innovation, and success over the past 50 years is truly something to celebrate tonight. I also want to thank some of our webinar uh, sponsors and the sponsors of our exhibition and catalog. They are UVA Arts Council, Molly and Robert Hardy and the H7 Foundation, the Gordon Darling Foundation, Agatha and Stephen Luxo, the Embassy of Australia, UVA Parents Fund, the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures at UVA, the Mapping Indigenous Worlds Lab, UVA Department of Art, and the Vice Provost for the Arts. I'd also like, like to thank the lenders to the second part of the Papunya Tula exhibition, Richard Klingler and Jane Slatter, Agatha and Stephen Luxo, Steve Martin and Ann Stringfield, and the family of James and Elaine Wolfenson. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the speakers who will be speaking tonight. Um, not everyone who contributed to the catalog is able to be with us tonight. And first, I'd like to acknowledge the, all of the Papunya Tula artists and their descendants who were so generous with their knowledge um, and wrote essays for the catalog and their words are throughout the catalog. So we're really grateful for them. I um, also like to thank Hetty Perkins and Cara Pinchback who aren't able to make it tonight because of other obligations, um, but we'll be talking about them. And um, also Steve Martin, who also is not able to make it tonight for another reason. Um, so I'd like to begin by just giving a brief introduction of each of our speakers um, that's gonna be speaking tonight. We're gonna to start off with Henry Skerritt. Many of you know Henry, he's the curator of the Indigenous Arts of Australia at Kluge Roo. And his exhibitions and publications include No Boundaries, Contemporary Aboriginal Australian Abstract Painting, and Marking the Infinite, Women Artists from Aboriginal Australia. Um, in addition to that, he's working on a, a really wonderful bark painting exhibition coming up in September this year at the Hood Museum of Art and then touring Madi and Eight Decades of Aboriginal Australian Bark Painting from Mirkala. Uh, following Henry, we'll hear from Fred Myers. Fred is the Silver Professor of Anthropology at New York University and the author of the books, Pin to Be Country, Pin to Be Self, um, Sentiment, Place, and Politics Among Western Desert Aborigines and Painting Culture, the Making of an Aboriginal High Art. After Fred, we'll hear from John Keane. John is an independent writer, producer, and curator. He's an honorary associate of the Museum Victoria, where he's a producer for 15 years. And from 1977 to 1979, he was the art advisor at Punya Tula Artists. Um, after John, we'll hear from Marina Strucki. Marina is an internationally exhibited painter and printmaker whose work is held in many national collections. She was founding manager of Akunji Artists and in 1994 facilitated the Minma Dukapa Kintor Haas Bluff Painting Project, Catalyzing the Women's Painting Mo Movement at Papunya Tula. And after Marina, we'll hear from Paul Sweeney. Paul is the manager of, was the past manager of Papunya Tula Artists for many, many years, um, a position he held from 2003 to the very end of 2021. Uh, prior to this, he worked in roles of assistant manager and field officer during his 26 years at the company. I'm really delighted that we can hear from all of these people, and I'm going to turn it over to Henry Skerritt to kick it off. So as an art historian, the idea of working on a 50th anniversary exhibition for Papunya Tula artists was both a dream and a challenge. The challenge was how to retell a story that uh, in Vivian Johnson's famous words, has been told and retold so often that it's almost assumed the power of a dreaming narrative itself. But when you think about it, that's because it's a really incredible story. It's really a minor miracle for any arts organization to last 50 years, but to remain relevant and more so even foundational to the narrative of Australian art over this length of time is simply extraordinary. Unfortunately, here at Kluge Roo, our ambitions usually exceed our resources. And so we knew that our space was not going to be sufficient to tell this story in all its glory. And so we made three big leaps of faith, three decisions. The first was, uh, thanks to the generous support uh, of Robert and Molly Hardy, 
uh, we put in some new walls uh, so that we could put up some uh, wonderful large paintings like these three you see from the first exhibition. The second, thanks to the Gordon Darling Foundation and many other sponsors, was to publish a catalogue. Uh, and if you haven't got it yet, um, I'd recommend hunting one down because it's 280 pages of extraordinary essays and images from artists, curators and scholars. And most importantly, it's really a book that is filled with passion and joy and intellectual reverie. And I think as this webinar progresses, you'll, you'll, you'll see that excitement um, that all of the contributors um, have when, when the topic of Papania Tula artists comes up. Um, we really hope that um, this book will be a, a lasting contribution to the field. And I am extraordinarily grateful uh, to my co-editor, Fred Myers, uh, and all of the contributors for helping to make it. Um, such a wonderful publication. But lastly, we realized we were going to need to split the exhibition in two. And in some ways that might've seemed like a really arbitrary decision, but quite fortunately, 1995 marked a perfect watershed signaling as it did the year that Papania Tula artists first brought women painters into the company. This of course didn't happen out of thin air. Uh, and those of you that have read Marina's quite magnificent essay in the catalogue will know that it took several years, starting in 1994, when um, women from Kintor and Haas Bluff came together out of a shared desire to paint. But um, I think that's a story best left for Marina. She tells it much better than anyone else. Um, but it was also around this time that Margot Smith began working for John W. Kluge as curator of his growing collection. And in an extremely prescient move, Margot acquired five works from the very first exhibition of Papania Tula artists, women artists, um, held at Utopia Art in Sydney. So that gave us a natural starting point for this exhibition. And as you enter, you're greeted by five jewels, um, and I'll point them out. That's Tartali at the top, um, Naui Nangala, uh, Inua Nampajimpa, Nurupayam, Mrs. Bennett, often known, and Jankan Napujari. These would be some of the last works that John Kluge acquired um, before um, donating his collection to the University of Virginia. And so as a result, our, our, our collections of more recent Papania Tula artists are relatively limited, which meant that we knew we were gonna have to lean on some of our great friends and supporters from the estate uh, the family of James and Elaine Wolferson, we were able to um, borrow this rather magnificent uh, painting on the left by Ronnie Jumpajimpa that was uh, in fact included in the major exhibition Papania Tula Genesis and Genius at the Art Gallery of New South Wales in 2000. Um, from our friend Stephen Nagatha Luxo, um, some of whom uh, will remember the 2017 gift um, that made up the exhibition Songs of a Secret Country. Um, we were able to borrow this really quite fabulous um, painting by George Jungarai, um, as well as uh, a work by Doreen Reed, uh, which is seen here uh, next to another really fantastic painting, which we borrowed from the art collector Steve Martin, who um, I'm sure all of you know best as a contributor to the exhibition catalogue. Uh, he also loaned us works from Nada Nungarai, Wallamperinga, Japujari and Yakuchi Napangadi. So, you know, really helping us to tell this important story of Papania Tula's continuing success uh, and particularly the recent successes in New York City. Lastly, from our friends Richard and Jane Klingler, we were able to borrow important works by McKinty Napananka, Ningara Naparula, and Inua Nampajimpa. Now, all three of these works were shown in the exhibition Dreaming Their Way. Um, which was really the, one of the first major exhibition of Indigenous Australian women held in the United States. It was at the National Museum of Women in the Arts and also uh, a significant works by George uh, and Patrick Jungarai. On their own, these 11 works would have made a fantastic exhibition. The names that I have just reeled off poorly uh, constitute a veritable who's who of Australian art of the last 25 years. But it was important to us that we also showed Papania Tula as a continuing enterprise. 
a movement that has not stopped, but continues to grow in dynamism and vitality. So I asked Paul Sweeney, I went to Paul Sweeney with an idea. I think it was at the Darwin Art Fair, wasn't it, Paul? And I said, Paul, 50 artists, 50 works, a suite that would capture the movement as it currently stands, leading artists side by side with those emerging to take the baton. And I remember Paul's expression in his unflappable manner. I think he said, yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of work but it speaks to his passion for the art and the artists of Papanyatula that when he started unrolling canvases, looking for gems, it didn't take too long, I think, for his excitement to take hold. It was a thrilling process for me, waiting for the morning emails to roll in, uh, each one with a new gem, but the result was something really, truly spectacular far better than I could have imagined because seeing these works in the gallery all together shows exactly what makes Papanyatula artists great. Every one of these works in the 50th anniversary suite is a perfect small world unto itself, but taken together, they represent so much more. They represent a coming together, a movement, a community, and it was a coming together in 1971 that first brought Papanyatula artists to the world. With the 50th anniversary suite, I think we see a little of the power that's held it together and a power that I hope will hold it together so that we can come back here and do this again in another 50 years. Thanks, Henry. That was great. Okay, John, you're up next. Okay. Um... I want to thank uh, Margot and Henry and the uh, Kluge Ru Aboriginal Art Collection for including me in the project of of combining Papanyatula artists past and present in this exhibition and catalog. It's been a great gift and a great pleasure to be part of it. So um, that's Papanyatula a few years ago when Paul was the ma managing there in deep inside. Um, 48 years ago, I began to learn to be language and culture from many of the very people whose work is in this project. <clears throat> I owe them a lot for their generosity and the lessons I learned from them about many things and not just about their paintings. But during my time in the various Pintabi communities, I documented for Panyatula hundreds of paintings and I have wanted this knowledge to be lost. In working with Henry on the exhibition and catalog and our conversations remotely and otherwise with John Keane, Marina, Strokey, Hetty Perkins, Carol Pinchback, Paul Sweeney, we've tried to offer whatever knowledge we could to a set of paintings that are often appreciated, but rarely understood in their depth of possibility. This has meant for me going back to my old notes, correcting and rejecting some of the poorly provenanced accounts of works and jumping through interpretive possibilities offered by the form of the paintings. I'm especially appreciative of Henry's talented grasping what might be in an image. For me, the product has been trying to illuminate the link between the forms the painters have placed on the two-dimensional surfaces and the landscape, story, songs, rituals, and movements that have inspired these expressions. This is, I believe, where we might look to understand the creativity and imagination in Papanyatula. And here I'm grateful to my collaborators in the catalog for their inspirations and their attempts to respond to my incessant requests and continuing for many details. One splendid moment was a conversation with John Keane, whose interest in the natural environment opened up the vision of what is in one of my favorite paintings in the uh, Kluge Ru collection, Winchia Nabaljari's Wartunuma Playpan. Wartunuma is the word for the flying termite. This conversation uh, connected to another a few years ago with Paul Sweeney about the flight of these Wartunuma and their glistening wings as they um, uh, left uh, in, in the evening and much earlier conversations with my beloved Pintabi interlocutor, Shorty Longada Jungarai about goannas, flying termites, and the nature, and the season of nature's fertility. <clears throat> From John came the suggestion that the black discs in the painting referred to flat beds or pavements known as linchi, created by flying termites in the Spinifex country, which are used by men as a platform for ceremony and for many other things. These black discs can be seen here in Winchi and Nabaljari's painting of the site. I'm not going to go into more details, they're in the catalog. As a celebration of 50 years of this unprecedented cooperative, we're honoring those who have shared, indeed, asserted their culture. 
This is the first, the story I first learned at Yayai, the Pintabi outstation community from which Pintabi made their way incredibly back to their own country. In celebrating Papanyatula Kluyuru, we are recognizing one of the extraordinary achievements of Aboriginal self-determination as they understood it as a way to make themselves known. Through their pains, they have asserted the recognition of their claims to their homelands, as well as a means to support themselves in transmitting this culture to future generations, further amplified by inventing the Purple House Dialysis Project to help elders remain on country. Along the way, Papanyatula has gathered a team of allies of countrymen who have joined them to make their paintings visible. For this Wartunua paintings, we might be reminded that Melina Strokey here tonight led the workshops in which Winchia and many other Pintabi women began to put their images on canvas. <clears throat> this is another one of hers. Um, but um, uh, here I wanted to show one of uh, uh, Marina's own uh, photographs that she had shared with us of one of the very first paintings by that Nabal Jaris, as she refers to the Winchia and Chunkaya which preceded these beautiful paintings that um, we have of uh, Winchia's. Finally, because Hetty can't be here, I wanna mention an extraordinary anecdote she shared with us when we interviewed. This is a pitch for the catalog, by the way, showing what we might see as the country's approval of this work. When she attended the opening of the Kintour swimming pool, funded by an auction at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, over, which she oversaw, and by Papanya Tula artists, Hetty told us, Henry and I in the interview, I went back to the art center to get out of the sun and have a minute to myself and I saw Matthew West Chobarula. And as I said to him, this dust, I said to him, this dust, today we're opening this pool and it's so dusty and everything. And he said, oh, it's those Kunga Kutata, referring to the Kunga Kutata Chokorpa identified with the Wallingoro site itself. They're pounding their wana, their digging sticks. They're happy for this thing and happy that water has come here. They're pounding their sticks. That's what the dust is. It's an honor to continue to be part of their lives and their projects in some small way. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, and we just can't say enough about Fred's role in bringing the catalog together and the virtual resource um, in throwing himself into it. <laughs> I, I remember having a number of phone calls with you throughout the project. And you know, each time you were more and more excited about what you were discovering with Henry and um, just participating in it and we're just so grateful for your participation it's really brought together what i think is a, a wonderful publication and resource hopefully for the future so um okay john we'll go to you now yep uh it's wonderful to be here again with colleagues and um it's been a fantastic project to be a part of. Uh, I'd like to recognise the Papania Chula artists as my mentors. Um, they started me off uh, and taught me so much that I've carried through life. So I'll go back to the uh, my first encounter with Papania Chula art, which was at a, a an obscure art school in Gippsland in 1976. So it's appropriate that. Um, uh, this exhibition is also in a university museum. The exhibition, Peter Stuyvesant Collection of Aboriginal Art, comprised of 30 or so paintings by Papania artists, and it hung in a nondescript hallway. I remember sta standing in front of Kapa Jimpa Jimpa's uh, Wind Particle Serpents. Virtually each day of the exhibition, I mulled the enigma of its creation in a place beyond my ken. The painting's bold balance of exotic iconography was unlike anything I'd previously encountered, and I could not imagine the, the painting's curate, cur, creator. But my curiosity led me inexorably to Papania, and as if I'd telegrammed um, ahead with my interests, Carpa knocked on the door of the flat where I was staying just minutes after I rolled into Papania. Carpa was a gregarious friend, always on the move, but at this stage in our relationship, I knew little of how this restless man could produce such a well-considered and imperious work. Um, it's almost 50 years since I saw the first uh, exhibition of Papania paintings, and they are now as intriguing and as multi-level to me as they were back as a scruffy art student. I spent the best part of the last 10 years trying to unravel just how this new art form was made and how it developed. So I was really thrilled to be asked by the exhibition's curators, Henry and Fred, to be a 
a part of the uh, Iriditya Kawari Jungle team, especially so as my role would be to travel to the artist communities and consult with Amadjura, Luricha and Pindabi speaking people. This all occurred last May, sort of in the heart of COVID, and I sort of somehow got through all of those windows out into the bush. My journey started um, by road from Melbourne, uh, went to Alice Springs, where I met the descendants of some of the artists who live in town. I then travelled north on the bitumen, turning off to Laramba, where I met Amadjura elders on the side of their ceremonial ground. We talked of Kapa Jambi Jimba, Tim Lura, and Clifford Possum. Some of the sites that they were painted, that they painted, were visible from where we sat and talked. I then went to Papanya in Honey Ant Country, where it all started in 1971. There's a new arts centre in Papanya, and they're the daughters of Johnny Warangola, Jack Philippus, um, uh, Limpy Jungarai. Uh, Limbi Jabagandi, sorry, um, paint their father's and grandfather's country. I then followed this incredible mountain range that uh, anyone who's travelled out west will have burned into their, the back of their retina um, and stopped at Yamantorongo to speak to Charlie Egerly and Warangal's son under this sort of huge, huge omnipresent mountain. There's so much history at Mount Liebig um, if only I had time uh, now to tell you some of the stories of this place. The road west took me even further into arid country along the grain of sand hills until the profile of Wallangoral and Yunshu appeared on the horizon. That's about uh, 400 kilometres out. The mountains are tr the transmogrified bodies of the Kunga Kudara, who you saw in the painting just before, and Nintaka, a giant monitor lizard, and they define and dominate the community. Women's side, men's side. The community at Kintour is a dynamic place, unpredictable, always, uh, you're on edge at Kintour. Um, it's the refuge that Pindaby first returned after decades of exile in Papanya. It's also their most one of the most significant art making sites in Australia, and the site where many of the paintings in the current exhibition were created. Now in the heart of Pindaby country, I was joined by Matthew Pinter Jabangadi. One of his paintings uh, is in those fifth group of 50. Um, an old friend who traveled with me past the Northern Territory, Western Australia border through his country into Western Australia to Kiwikura, Australia's most isolated township. After a couple of days discussing paintings and renewing friendships, Matthew arranged for the Papanya Trula trip carrier to take us plus two senior owners, Joseph Jarrah and Ray James Jungler, to a very important site even further in the bush. We headed off on the track north before leaving the road and travelling cross country following a single tyre track made by Matthew two years earlier. Budgerigars that were abundant in the country at that time flashed green in front of the truck. We crossed several sand dunes and changed a spiked tyre on the top of the last sand hill. The valley below was filled with flowering wattles. A flaming red escarpment, Yarra Yarra, was our destination. From that moment, we adopted the pro proper protocols when visiting a sacred site. The ancestors were addressed and we entered a small cave, seldom visited. Yarrow Yarrow secrets are known only to Pindaby men. The visit to Yarrow Yarrow was a fitting climax and a symbolic culmination to the research for Iriditja Kawari Jungle. Appropriately, Iriditja Kawari Jungle is presented in a university museum, a long, long away, <laughs> away from where, where I am, that I hope will bring inspiration to many fortunate enough to visit. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. I just want to also say that it was thrilling to follow your trek through the desert um, by seeing the photographs that you took, which were just stunning. And uh, you were posting kind of when, when you could. And, you know, it just it just gave us such a sense of being there with you. So I was the lucky one. <laughs> Well, you're quite a talented photographer as well. So it did really bring that um, to life for all of us. So thank you. 
Okay, Marina. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And it's been great to see you all again and hear your, um, your contributions. Um, just to, to go back in history a little while, um, the first time I saw a Papanya Chula painting was the Johnny Warangula um, water dreaming board that's owned by the NGV. Back in those days, Judith Ryan had a minuscule spot up at the top of the escalators at the National Gallery of Victoria. Um, and um, I was reminded by her the other day that there was also this strange TARDIS, a glass elevator that took you up from the ground floor up to this little platform. And when you got out of the TARDIS, you had a tiny little space, but it was crammed with early boards. And in 1986, I remember seeing the marks of uh, Johnny Warangula's paintbrush, so delicate and so moving, um, you know, um, life-changing for me really, because I ended up going on a trip to the desert a few years later and um, fancifully just met someone at Glen Helen who was introduced himself as Johnny W, a famous artist. And I noted that in my diary and realized later that it was actually that same Johnny Warangula. But um, I'll just uh, forge ahead and um, Australian art centers are unique in the realm of First Nations enterprises. Papanya Chula has led the way for painting in the desert. Kirikura has been called the most isolated location on earth, yet paintings from here are seen on Madison Avenue and on Beyonce's Instagram account. This story of two talented and hardworking women connecting despite vast distances, geographical and cultural, went viral in the remote desert of Central Australia, adding yet another twist to the story. To be a First Nations artist is a form of political activism and painting is a daily affirmation of land rights. It is a way to bring chukupa into the everyday workplace. Through painting, the artist is saying, this is my country, these are my ancestors, this is my name, this is my family story. The success of the painting movement has given these artists a forum which is rare across this continent and throughout the rest of the world for First Nations people. The desert paintings have an intensity that affects people from all around the world. There is an honest humanity that seems to filter through the work. Papanya Chula's role in facilitating painting has been a saving grace for the people in this region. Painting is a therapeutic action. It gives people a break and a chance to feel better. It is the counterpoint to the regular traumatic events out bush. To survive in the desert takes resilience and tenacity. Desert people have these qualities in spades, as does Papanya Chula, which has kept its unwavering gaze on the core function of painting. And Paul, you know, your contribution's been immeasurable. The Kintor House Bluff Women's Painting Project in 1994-95 was a response to a declared desire by the Kintor women to paint. They wanted to paint every day as the men did at Kintor and earlier years at Yaya and Papanya. In April 1996, the women at Kintor started painting regularly for Papanya Chula, which led to the Kirikura women painting too. 2021 marks 25 years of these women painting for the company. In 1999, I worked for Papanya Chula mainly at Kintor. It was a huge year in terms of the number of paintings done by great artists. There was sadness too with the passing of artists, including Pinta Pinta Japananga, who was a constant presence at the old art shed, even on Sunday mornings. In fact, they were nice quiet times with him, sharing food or going to get firewood. That year, it was a great honor for me to chaperone Turkey Tolson and his two mothers, Chunkai and Winchia, to the 25 Years and Beyond Papanya Chula exhibition at Flinders University Gallery in Adelaide, 
which included work by the Kintor and Kirikura women. <coughs> the women brought fresh energy to the company and painting gave them a new job, which they took up with youthful vigor, many starting in their 70s. The company had humble beginnings with men painting on scrounged materials and debating imagery suitable for an outside audience in this isolated and dusty place in the middle of Australia. In 2022, after 50 years, overcoming factors working against the endurance of the company and painting, this movement has engulfed many other remote regions and has become the truly unique art from this continent and holds its own alongside great works by Roscoe or Frank Stella and the expressive works of Dubuffet and Paul Clay or any 20th century masterpieces. Picasso praised the brilliance of the work done by the top end artist, Yirrawala. If there is a symbol of Australian culture, apart from the sporting world, indigenous art led by Papunya Chula would be that cultural symbol. Embraced by the colonized and the colonizers, it is the ground where we meet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marina. Um, your essay in the catalog is one that um, just spoke to me so much because of the, the real uh, sensory experience of being there that you convey. And it made me, it just took me right back to my experience in the desert. And I, I greatly appreciate it. Getting dusty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, Paul, let's hear from you. Hi everyone, um, sound good? Yeah. Um, thank you um, so much for inviting me back. Um, we had a great time as we all remember on the first panel and, and this has been equally as interesting and entertaining. Um, I, I can certainly echo Henry's uh, thoughts and comments about the process of putting those uh, the suite of 50 works together, which was, uh, yeah, he was very kind with the reaction, describing the reaction that he got from me when he first mentioned it, because I think my heart just kind of fell through the floor at the thought of trying to find 50 great pictures, the same size to put together. But as, as time progressed, of course, that uh, dread, or if it was, um, certainly turned to a lot of excitement and, and enthusiasm. And it became very clear that uh, we might not sort of storm across the 50 work mark, but we were certainly going to get there. And um, the process was, was, was a lot of fun. And that wall that you've got there, I wish was here actually, because that's just the most fantastic image um, to see on the screen here. So um, the first time that I spoke with you, uh, I was sort of more focused on the, um, the sort of current situation and the, and the what was going on now, as I recall. Um, but what I have to say today relates directly back to that um, moment of um, genesis, if you like, when the ladies arrived on the scene and hearing Marina um, talking about that 95, 96 window is, um, it just evokes so many, so many memories. And um, I, I, for one, I, I don't think, even though I was there in the standing there watching it and having so much to do with facilitating it I, I really well I can't say I was totally aware of the gravity of it all I just did not it didn't occur to me at the time um, how significant and important what I was part of and, and, and witnessing actually was going to be and um, that's certainly something that's grown immensely on me over the years um, so as um, you've mentioned, Margo, I, I am a former now manager. Um, I'm actually on um, this great Australian institution called Long Service Leave, which I'm sorry to learn doesn't exist over there. But for any Australian employee that does 10 years 
consecutively you get paid to take three months off, which is what I'm on at the moment. But despite not being in the office in the gallery working, I am still um, finding myself something to do behind the scenes. And that the main thing I'm doing is scanning images of paintings um, from the um, beginning of the women's painting, which I've, I've gone back to January 1996. There, there was, prior to me starting there in, in late 95, there wasn't really a cohesive archive of um, photographs of all the paintings being done. So it's something that, that I was determined to do with, with Janice and Daphne who were managing at the time. And this probably relates back to my um, previous sort of employment as a photographer. I was, I was really quite um, animated about the fact that they should be photographing every single work and it should be stored. So they, they were right up with that. And we started photographing works and storing them very laboriously in these photo albums um, that look like this. They're fabulous old things. And um, it was terribly kind of labor intensive, but as the archive grew, it became more and more important. Um, and for many reasons in the future, I'm sure that'll still be the case, researchers and what have you can come in and look at those photos. So I'm scanning them busily and doing that is taking me back to the studio into that moment. And I can see things that are reminding me of events that took place on the day, which has been, um, very, very interesting and, and um, um, a fun, fun process. So um, I've got some interesting facts that I've that I dug up to share with you. So I, I'm scanning from January 1996, and I've, I'm now up to December 2000. And during that time, um, I can let you know that in those first five years, 103 women painted, which uh, is extraordinary in itself, but possibly more so is the fact that collectively they produced a total of 4,551 paintings. Now that's only in 96, 7, 8, 9 and 2000. So I'm, uh, this, the, the uh, analogue, if you like, archive, the, the old printed photographs runs up till about 2010. We were a little bit slow jumping to the digital era, but somewhere around there, uh, we did switch to digital. So there's another decade only to get to 2010. So um, I've, I've sort of loosely done some numbers and I've come to the, to the assumption that uh, the combined output of works by the women of Papunya Tula artists to date would be somewhere around 23 and a half thousand paintings, Yay! which is just an uh, insane amount of work. I, I have to... I'd have to admit that those pictures, having walked through the, the entire library of those first five years, they certainly weren't all masterpieces. That, that, that's a fact, but goodness me, there was, there was so much being done that showed so much potential and um, so much promise that of course has come to be realized in, um, in a, a, a way that many of us probably would never have imagined at the time. Um, the early shows that took place in 96 uh, with those early works, and I'm talking about shows that were at Utopia Art Sydney and Gab Gallery Gabriel Pitsy in Melbourne, um, they, were, they were largely made up of small works. Um, not that many of the ladies were doing works bigger than four foot square at the time. Occasionally the odd five by four, but um, certainly nothing bigger than that. Those, those works, those exhibitions in those works were um, snapped up and, and sold out in no time at all. Um, and I know the state galleries were very active on the scene at the moment. And I've always thought that that was uh, largely due to the fact that given the, the 
community of people and the collectors and, and curators who had who had taken a keen interest in the company and followed the history to that point uh, were acutely aware of the significance and value of the the uh, early men's works so rather than that initial lag from the 71 to three period where things were they were there they, they were kind of looked at a bit and there were shows that toured and there was some keen interest but there certainly wasn't a, a wide-based uh, world of collectors who were heavily focused on it and that that didn't come along too much later but with the women there seemed to be an immediate spotlight there was interest from the outset obviously um, with Marina's work and and the placement of some of those paintings with the National Gallery of Victoria and the publicity that was along with those fueled that. Um, but those first exhibitions, as modest as they were, were um, were very very keenly um, watched at the time, which was pretty fascinating to think of. Um, obviously now. Um, things have just gone absolutely to the next level. There has been monumental solo exhibitions by many of those ladies, McKinty, Napanunka, Ningara Naparula, Nata Nungarai, Winchi and Napuljari, along with her sister, Junkai. They have all had um, hugely, hugely successful solo shows and, and with not surprisingly, have also um, taken on the very, very largest sizes that the company paints on the frames that are eight foot by six foot. Uh, occasionally there's a commission that might be slightly larger, but those that, that format is readily um, painted. Um, you don't need to look much further than someone like Yakulchi, for example, who has, um, had a fabulous um, exhibition in, in New York with, with several paintings that size. Um, and just to bring the whole point up to um, the present, um, Hetty, who obviously couldn't make it today um, and for good reason, her, her exhibition that she's working on at the moment at the National Gallery of Australia, the uh, fourth Aboriginal art triennial called Ceremony, uh, she chose, I don't think I'm letting any cats out of the bag or encroaching on any media embargoes here, but she had she focused very heavily on Mantua Nungala from Kiwikura um, for this exhibition. And um, she has, the National Gallery actually commissioned a triptych of eight by sixes, which is something that has, to my knowledge, has never been attempted by anyone in Papunya Tula in its history. And uh, I had was looking at an email of hers this earlier this morning, and she's, she just said it's absolutely jaw-dropping. Mantua, from what I'm hearing, pretty much owns the show <laughs> with the, the whole front entry into the exhibition. The first thing you see on this 20 something meter long wall is three eight by sixes hanging side by side, which is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a new, new thing and something that will, will obviously make a serious impression to people that go, I would think. Um, when I asked Margot what, what she would like me to um, talk about today, she was very quick to come back with the suggestion that perhaps um, I focus on the early part of the women's movement and perhaps show up some, some photos of the exhibitions that we have done in the US, um, which there is a brief PowerPoint of, I believe, on either Margot or Henry's desktop. Um, if you would be good enough just to perhaps flick through some of those, Margot, I can give you a very brief commentary on some of those moments i think um, well, um hold on just a second because i i'd like to actually pose a couple questions to you yeah, all. Sure. Um, and then i'd be happy to put them up and we can perhaps just conclude with that um but you know i was so interested in reading about um in marina's essay about 
kind of the the drive of some of the early women artists you know at, at this point you know certainly artists male artists were were getting paid for their work and 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 making some good um income off of that but she was you know she was warned that the women weren't going to get paid for these paintings and she um she wrote about how McKinty would turn up uh you know even with failing eyesight and you know just churn churn out work um and you know was obviously just highly driven uh and prolific during that early period. And so I just wanted to talk about the drive of artists and some of some others might want to weigh in on this as well. And, and even about the drive of people who, you know, of, of artists later, you know, in the, in the, after they returned to their homelands, you know, mm. how, was what was driving them to produce this art different from what was driving them initially. So Marina, maybe you could talk first just about some of the individual women and then see if, if Fred wants to chime in or John. In terms of drive, um, well, it, the way it came to me was that the, the group of women at Kintor who were so, sort of on my back to help them, um, they were, they were really into singing and dancing. So it, it came, so the women who weren't into singing and dancing weren't, weren't, in, weren't wanting to paint. So it was like, it, was, it seemed to be like a, a connection to singing and dancing. They, they saw it as a connection, a way of, um, but also of working. You know, they wanted to work. They, they would sit by the fires at night making that, punu work, the burnt poker work stuff, or unraveling jumpers and turning them into baskets, you know, by dusk. And so th there was, but but the, there were men like that as well, you know, Pinter Pinter would arrive at 7.30 in the morning, you know, with his nulla nulla and just bang it on the, bang it on the art, old art room door, like, you know, <laughs> announcing parliament or something. Um, but you know, there's certain characters who who knew about painting, who were painting, or who could see other people painting. There's a drive, you know, and there's an, a need. You know, people were wanted to be busy, so um, uh, that that was my experience. That you know, people, and then once you start painting, it's addictive. You feel good when you do it, and it. It brings you into yourself. It, you know, they've done new, neuroscience of, of art is very good for people, especially in chaos. It has a calming influence. So, it, you know, people in, uh, you know, white Europeans have tried, tried a lot of experiments with, with in, introducing the, the labour market to Indigenous people and... It worked, cat, cattle and stockmen, that was successful um, because the people were good with the land and animals and rangers being park rangers. But, you know, it's phenomenal. It's, it, I don't know that we really fully understand how phenomenal it is that, that, that this, that painting, it's, it's, it's all about how it makes you feel and, and, you, and you get paid as well. Could I break in? Um about a, a couple of really early recollections of, of women uh, wanting to paint. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, I was uh, doing the Papania Chula job in the late 70s at a time where there was virtually no market. Um, the, the, you know, painting suitcase sized paintings would sell a bit um, by great artists and, you know, fly out of Alice Springs. Uh, there were there was the first commercial gallery exhibition happened, um, so there was there was a very uh, limited capacity to take new artists on, um, and that sort of excluded all sorts of people on the periphery of of the uh, male uh, side of things as well as as women. My first uh, recollection of a woman um, wanting to um, sell her paintings 
was uh, I was driving out on the the West Camp, and you know people used to live behind um, uh, windbreaks, and I saw this thing being waved uh, above the windbreak, and it was a, a canvas board with um, inanity uh, painted, but with inanity seeds stuck on the surface. Um, women make uh, use these red seeds to make beautiful necklaces, but uh, that yeah that that was the first time women's painting was literally flagged um, for me as something that uh, should should happen and had to happen, and it did start happening in um, in Papunya in in a pretty minor way, and like Marina said. Um, amongst those women who were most uh, keenly attached to ceremony. So um, Daisy, uh, Lura Nakamura, uh, Topsy, uh, Nabuljari, um, you know, Lottie Nabuljari and, uh, sorry, Lottie Nangala, all of those women who would every night go um, sort of slightly away from their camp on the east side of town um, and, you know, sort of, stamp the the earth um and sing every every night they were the ones who who got it going then there were, it just didn't quite click somehow um and it wasn't supported um you know in a big way by by papunya chula until marina's great effort so it was sort of at any moment i think given a catalyst like marina became uh later on women's painting would have exploded if the uh, the the uh, lid came off and um, you know women women were asked to do it you know there was heaps of women uh, with the comparable knowledge of of country um, and ceremony who were who were just ready to go so it's one of those tragic things looking at Papania Chula um, and thinking of the rest of Aboriginal Australia, if only all of those other ceremony people had um, had the opportunity to uh, share their vision, um, you know, during this colonial era, uh, what would have happened? <laughs> anyway, enough from me. I know there's some more to say on this topic, but I'd love to get to another question and uh, one that really has perplexed um, our guides is the, they really want to understand the idea of abstraction better. And, you know, how that has brought Western desert art and other forms of contemporary art together in what, in that, what Fred calls the contact center. So I wonder, Fred, if you want to say something about that. Well, I'm, there are, what, three people here who know a great deal more about 20th and 21st century art than me, <laughs> maybe four uh, at least. Um, I can only say that um, it seemed very clear to me that um, the connection, if you looked at who was interested in Papanya Tula art, and when I first was following these things as, you know, I would be from being you know, in Papunya or Yaya or Kintour, and then I'd be down in Sydney and I'd see these tribal art galleries and these other kinds of things, that um, the connection was really, um, the people who were interested in it were, you know, a set of Australians and, and non-Australians who were part of a generational uh, and a class formation who had, uh, and this is what I've argued anyway in my book, but I still believe it, that um, uh, who had cut their teeth on abstract expressionism and formalist modernism and so on. They had an understanding of it, an experience of it, an appreciation for it. And this work made its way into their hearts through that. But also um, for other people, it was its, uh, what they took to be its spirituality, right? Which is another kind of modernist uh, dimension that they've shared with other non-Western art. But I think what was crucial for many people was not necessarily spirituality, which didn't exactly allow it so easily to enter into the contemporary art world. It could have, but it wasn't really the medium for it as it was what it looked like. And it looked like, you know, as Marina just laid it out, you know, the, uh, you know Frank Stella, uh, you know, um, uh, Barnett Newman, a number of other people who are these sort of color fields, but even not only them, but also I would say probably, um, um, you know, the, what was it? when was the um, 
oh, what's his name? That, you know, um, five, um, uh, the painting that the uh, Art Gallery of New South, uh, that the National Gallery of Australia bought, it was the big, the, uh, I'm blocking the name of it now, uh, Henry uh -huh. can jump in. Oh. Um, yeah, the Jackson Pollock painting, which was, there was a, just an absolute Wait, intersection. Huh? Five pole, what's, uh, what's it called? Blue poles. Blue poles. Blue. There was this absolute intersection between the arrival in Australia of this painting, which was condemned by the Australian art world, which was very realist oriented, but embraced by a younger generation. So I think that that's the argument to be made around that. And I think it's not very complicated, um, but it allowed it to escape some of the frameworks which have been held. And also it was painted on two dimensions. Right, and it was uh, you know a flat and all these other things that made it, and it was transportable. Unlike bark paintings, you can't put them in, you can't roll them up. You can. There's a lot of features of this, the material dimensions of it, that made it possible. And then um, luck, you know, and then um, the development of the Aboriginal Arts Board and the kind of money that was put into it by people who appreciated it and gave it a kind of a market. That Peter Stuyvesant show that you saw. You know, that was the start, that, right? It was there, yeah. it was, look, it, it totally captured. <laughs> Went to 35 uh, yeah. venues across Australia and was seen by many art students. Yes. Uh, I, I think I might have been the only one who got hooked there and then. <laughs> but there were probably others. Yeah. Could, I, could I just say another yeah. sort of slice of the abstraction thing? And it's something that I think you can appreciate through an exhibition like uh, Iridicha Kawari Jungle or the catalogue, where um, it, it's as if the uh, focus in the paintings quite often comes uh, closer and closer and closer. So those early paintings are, are quite um, synoptic. They're from a distance, you know, literally Kappa's first painting, um, first big painting sort of sees the whole ceremony and gradually through this process, um, it comes down. And when, when I was there, lots of the paintings were actually based on designs um, from sacred boards and those sorts of things. You'd see the same design. So it was this process uh, coming down and into, um, you know, with Pinterby painting coming more and more into the detail. So um, just a tiny elaboration of one aspect, maybe the way the water refracts um, in a certain way or sand hills are aligned, you know, east to west or, or these sort of simple ideas that are really at the, at the essence of a particular uh, site, ceremony, country, um, so it's, yeah, it's just sort of the, the distillation of uh, re complex components down into these powerful kind of Frank Stella-like ideas, like the uh, image behind um, Marina's head right now. And that, that's one of the strengths of these sort of longitudinal exhibitions, I think, is that you can get a sense of that, um, um, you know, gradual development and focus. Thank you for that. Marina, before you share, I see you've got your hand up, but um, I just want to say, uh, if everybody can stay on a little bit longer, I'd, I'd like to keep this conversation going for five or 10 more minutes. Um, I know some people may have to drop off, and I certainly want to thank all of our presenters tonight um, before we have, uh, before we close the webinar, but um, there's a, there's a couple more questions that I would just love to ask if, it's okay to stay on just a little bit longer. Marina, did you want to go ahead? I just wanted to say about abstraction, like the um, the the body painting of of the women and the men. Um, it just trans transposed to to canvas really easily, um, and then there's the added thing of um, people who lived lived out bush all the time and spend a lot of time outside and, and out in the remote areas, the landscape, you know, you, you to, to know the landscape is to know the paintings and vice versa, particularly of the curicura work where it's so minimalist and you, you drive out, you go west and you notice that the landscape gets more and more and more minimalist. And, and somehow 
the the art from Kirikura reflects that minimalism um, and has organic qualities. You know, it um, uh, give me a pin to be minimalist painting over a Frank Stella any day because pin to be minimalism has soul as well, which is hard to hard to get with minimalism, and it has it, you know it's more felt, and um, I don't know, it just a, seems to be like a, a confluence of factors that that have made the the art, particularly from Papanichula, um, res resonate in 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 the wider um, art world, particularly the art world of abstract abstract and minimalism. Thank you for that. I, I have another question um, because so many of your essays uh, really talked about your experiences out bush with people, the landscape, as you just mentioned. Um, but they, they took me back to my experience in Australia and that was an experience that really shaped me as an adult and as a human being. And I just am curious in what ways did the experience that you had living and working with Aboriginal artists, Aboriginal people shape you? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think um, in a really deep way, um, just the, the humanity that is first and foremost in people's lives, you know, it's, it's like that it's drama all the time, but um, also just it's all about people you know um and connections and um i th i think i became a, an adult there and became sort of um um somehow you your instincts get get sharpened through through for my mind did out, out bush you know, people never asked me a direct question, but I knew from the minute I was out bush that my every move was watched and that I was just being watched. And I knew that if I said something, there was no saying something lightly. You know, if you said, yeah, I'll do that for you. It was like, you had to do it. And so that from the beginning, when I just fumbled out there for two weeks, because my friends, Wayne and David Lawell said, because I'd been working as a community artist in sort of minority groups in Melbourne, you know, prisoners, refugees, and sort of working with them. And um, and just, um, they, they said, you know, you've got to go out there, you, you know, you'll love it. And, you know, there's stuff for you to do out there. Plus also I found it my own way through stumbling across a... Um, a video of the Ernabella women making silks. You know, I'd, I'd been living in Paris and I thought that was exotic, but I came back and I saw these women, you know, with, you know, football beanies and Hawaiian shirts and Hawaiian skirts and boiling up these vats of chemicals and pulling out these exquisite silks and draping them across mulga bushes. And I just thought, what the hell's going on out there? This looks great fun. Um, so, you know, there was a seed there planted, but yeah, I think, I, I think that, uh, it, very formative years, you know, living with, um, living the, with people, seeing how they, what they survive. And, um, I learned a lot about health through, through working with indigenous people, health and, um, illness and, and they know how to grieve. They grieve in, in the most essential way you can and I felt like the first funeral I ever went to out bush was making up for all the sort of tight-lipped funerals I'd been to in Australia and I don't know it just it's it's you it's hard work but it it's sort of um it's it, deeply rewarding and you know I'm still you know I think it's I had the time of my life really does anybody else want to tackle that question? Paul, do you? <laughs> <laughs> hard too. It's uh, very hard. Yeah, look, hard to hard to summarise. Obviously, um, yeah, 
furthering on from Marina's comments, it's profound in a lot of ways. You, you have to reshuffle your priorities from the sort of Western sense to the uh, Western desert sense, if you like, and things that are important to us in our sort of ongoing mundane worlds are irrelevant out bush. And that's a whole lot of set of other realities that uh, a lot of Westerners don't cope well with trying to adjust to, I think it'd be fair to say. Um, I've introduced a lot of people out bush over the years and certainly isn't for everyone. Um, I, there's a, I joke about a, um, a, a drawer in the filing cabinet at work, which is I referred to as the boneyard, which is a folder of all the former employees that I had to orientate over the years. Um, and it, it, it was, I was just shy of 70 different field workers that I had recruited and um, talked up what a beautiful, amazing experience they were in for, only for many of them to burn out and run back to the capital city within 12, 18 months or less in some cases. People sometimes just came back they couldn't even finish their first field trip, which went for three weeks. You know, it's it's not for everyone. And as Marina said, it's 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 um, confronting at a lot of levels and challenging and and stuff that that you have to sort of navigate with an open mind and and an open heart. Um, but if you can break through that, there's just so many beautiful things to expose your soul to. Um, I, I jotted down a quick, just while I've got the microphone, I jotted down a quick anecdote that Daphne once um, passed on to me, one of the many, um, and this is in relation to when, Margot, you were speaking before about what drives the women and that word drive, driven, my goodness, the most driven group of people on the planet, what drives these ladies to paint. And I think it, it would be fair to say we would relate closely to what traditional life would have been like you, you have to you just have to go and do it you have to keep going so much depends on everything just keeping up that that um level of of action and um energy um but andrew crocker who was the um art advisor not long after you john um mentioned to Daphne once and they must have they must have been having a conversation about the women starting and um, Andrew said to Daphne don't start the women don't start them because if you do you'll never stop them couldn't be a true word said that's, that's good <laughs> news okay one one final question um, and that is what now that this book and research has been done, which has uncovered some really wonderful uh, new information. And after 50 years, what remains? What, what, has this, what has this project revealed that needs further uh, research or exploration? What questions have come up for you, Fred, <laughs> for your next book? <laughs> well, I don't know if I have another book, but I... Um... The next book is John's book, which is really, I tell you, I got to read his dissertation. It's utterly brilliant and it will blow your minds just to see what he's able to do. Uh, whether anybody else can do that, I don't know. I'm right now, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to interview Marina and Iggy. <laughs> I have a, there's a lot of people who know a lot who have, um, uh, you know, given much to people along the way. And there's a lot of memories, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of understanding of people's careers of painting. Um, we have been able to put together some, I, some things we'll never know. I mean, there's a lot about Andrew Crocker. I knew him uh, that we won't, but I think that um, there are many more stories really about this. And I think that we don't really understand still a lot of what's in a lot of the paintings and we probably never will. 
understand about little bits keep coming up all the time. I just had a whole set of exchanges about what's in these Marapinti paintings and what the hell are they thinking when they paint them? And uh, it just, you know, the, you know, I had an email from somebody and they asked me to translate this and what about that? And Paul had told me about this other thing and Marina, all of a sudden I said, oh, I got it. You know, there's, there's this other connection. And what it was really is what Marina was saying. So many of the paintings actually, if they don't refer to, they're somehow bound up with the performance, the dancing, the ceremonies. But I mean, just even the dancing and the movements of, the, of them that we maybe never saw or the women shuffling their steps, we didn't realize that there was actually that that shuffling like the women, you know, the dust and so on, that these things are actually somehow referred to in the paintings. And so the, I think the one thing we didn't say about the abstraction is uh, one thing that Jeff Barden truly got right, which was the hapticity. There's this sense of the touch in, the, in these paintings, somehow even the flattest of them, that there's something there. But that's what I mean, there's a lot to do. I don't think I, I mean, I just keep asking people questions until they write it down or they tell me something and maybe we can put it together. But that's really the, you know, what I think there's still possibilities to, to learn more. Um, John, did you want to say anything? Uh, for sure. Um, thanks, Fred. That's uh, a fantastic endorsement. Um, I finished the last chapter uh, just a few days ago, and I'm revising the conclusion for the publication. So the last chapter you haven't read, Fred, it's all about um, mapping and the, those big series of paintings that... Uh, um, uh, Clifford Possum did in the late 1970s, which sort of uh, unfold a geographic scope and the kind of totemic notion of the totemic landscape in a way that um, uh, is quite extraordinary. Um, for me, what, sort of combining the two, two last questions, Margot, um, uh, what did you learn and what's, uh, what's uh, important to do? Um, the, the, uh, I concur with what everyone said about uh, how, how the um, experience affects you emotionally and how you learn about all, uh, many aspects of humanity. But also we, we can learn about uh, the land in a, in a very uh, direct and meaningful way. That means we don't have to white fellas like this one, don't have to be alienated on this continent. If we fully engage with the meaning behind paintings and uh, support that notion of country that's in there, we can sort of escape the um, intellectual tyranny of our colonial state. That's a very important thing to, to, um, to get through uh, at an individual level but also as a nation. Um, and I think the, following that on into what's left to be done at a kind of scholarly level is that these paintings tell us uh, not in necessarily in just generalized ways about country, but in very, very specific ways about, um, you know, how people lived on the land, um, how many uh, ecological systems like those Watanuma that um, that Fred was referring to, the flying ants and those sort of flat discs that they make. Uh, the paintings are, you know, treaties really on what this country is, uh, but they involve not necessarily well the kind of combination of art historical thought and ecological thought to uh, um, to to really go that bit further. So um, Henry was involved in that exhibition uh, Midwa uh, with uh, Mulkan uh, Wirapunda and John Wolseley in the top end. And I think that that exhibition is really exemplary about, um, you know, sort of intelligent reading of the land, um, you know, bicultural reading of the land so that, um, you know, we can, live better on this place and understand people more deeply. Thank you. 
I think we do really need to wrap up this webinar. Um, Henry, is there any last words you, that you'd like to say? Before I, I, I do. I do because I was listening to this, listening to everyone just then and thinking like I learned so much just doing this project with all of you and the the thing that I would encourage if there's anybody on the um, anybody who's listening is I think for a lot of people there's a sense that studying this work is too hard that that you know that the obstacles to thinking about it about getting engaged with um with this work is, is hard. And I, I would just encourage them all to get in touch with you guys because there's, there, you know, I think one of the things is just, we need more people looking at this work and more people appreciating it and really um, the kinds of intelligent and deep ways that you have all given us tonight. That's a great point. And I will also just plug the book one more time because the essays in it are so accessible, uh, so rich. And, um, you know, it's available from University of Virginia Press. You can just go to Kluge Roo's website. Um, you can get access to where to order the book. And you can also get access to the wonderful virtual resource. Um, so with that, I, I know a couple of people have asked in the chat, is this going to be recorded and available? Yes, it will be on Kluge Roo's YouTube channel in a few days. This has been a fabulous discussion. It's taken us in so many interesting directions. Uh, we thank our participants today, um, Fred Myers, John Keane, Marina Stroke, Paul Sweeney, and Henry Skerritt. Um, and, um, and we just hope to carry this conversation into the future. Uh, we need a lot more of these, obviously. <laughs> There's not enough time to cover it all. So thank you so much, everybody.